All right, so we're looking tonight, we're continuing our series to the letters to the seven churches of Revelation, and um, we get to the letter that I immediately thought would be the fi- my favorite one to preach on, because um, we're talking about the Church of Philadelphia. And one of the things about the Church of Philadelphia is that uh, they, it, it's a little bit more of a happier letter. There's, there's more going on here. It's, it's, it's the only letter, it's one of the few letters, sorry, that you won't find much criticism in, but really just a lot of praise and a lot of, a lot of um, you know, just good report for these people. And so I just want to start by just talking about this. As a pastor, I attend a lot of conferences. Um, this past week, I was away at our district conference in Kenosi. Anyone ever been down there before at Kenosi Lake at the resort? They're very, very nice area. Actually, great golf course. Check it out if you're ever down there. I, yeah, I, I intend to go back. I've never been there before. It was a good time. But, you know, as a pastor, you attend a lot of conferences. You hear, you read a lot of books about how to grow your church or how to improve your church. Anyone ever read some of these books before or kind of know what I'm talking about, right? There's lots of stuff out there on that. And, and, and forgive me maybe a little bit just for saying this, but sometimes it's easy to maybe get a little skeptical about, about church growth models or books or conferences from time to time. Because not every context is the same, is it, right? Not every community has the same personality. Not every church has the same focuses that the other churches have, right? And so what worked there doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work here. And what works here doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work way over on the other side of the city. Are you following me? And so when you, when you read some of this stuff, sometimes it's easy to have like this little idea when you hear these kinds of things where you kind of think to yourself, well, here we go again, right? Another how-to strategy. But here tonight we have a letter that was written by Jesus, the one whom we can trust more than anyone else. And he's writing to the church in Philadelphia, and not only is he writing to them, but he's, he's commenting on the good things that he sees them doing, the good stuff that's present in their church community. And if we can trust anyone's words, it would be the words of Christ and what he thinks will help, a, what will help a church live out his mission in this world. And so here we have this letter. And it's a lot happier than the others, as I said. There's not much in the form of correction here, but really there's, there's a little bit of praise. And, you know, there's a little bit of praise of the things that they were doing that kind of please God's heart. And so we kind of get to look in on this. We kind of get to spy in on this letter. And we get to glean on how these things can also help us on how they could help us live out the life that God wants for our church, things that we can aspire to. And so, so without further ado, let's break into the letter here in Revelation chapter 3. If you've got your phone or your Bible or however you want to read the scriptures, you can even follow on the screen. It's very bold up there. Here's what we read. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door so that no one, that, that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That just makes perfect sense, right? Okay, you could be honest. Maybe it was a little bit confusing when you were reading through that and following through that. And that's one of the things about this letter as I was studying it is it's very detailed. There's a lot of stuff that's being said here. And without being in that context, it's a little bit difficult for us to glean a couple of these things. But hopefully we can make some sense of it tonight. And so we're talking about the Church of Philadelphia. Philadelphia was a city. It's a city of commercial importance. Some people call Philadelphia the city of brotherly love. There you go. Every time I hear the word Philadelphia, I always think of an Elton John song, but that's not the case here tonight. 
but we're talking about Philadelphia. And, 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 and what, we hear, what we find out here at the beginning of this letter is some of the characteristics of this church. And so let's look at a couple things here tonight that we can glean about this church in, um, in Philadelphia. And, 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 and the first thing that we see is that we recognize the, the authority of Jesus as we look at this church. We recognize his authority. There's all this talk about the key of David. Anyone, anyone notice that when we first started up? There's this talk about the key of David. And in Isaiah chapter 22 and verse 22, we read, I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. And so what that's about, this whole key of David thing, is this is the prophet's back in the day, right? And what most commentators agree on is what this is talking about is it's talking about the Messiah who is to come. And that, as we know, is Jesus. And so this verse is talking about Jesus. It's a futuristic talk about Jesus, about how he's going to have the key to the door. He's going to have the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. It's words about the the Messiah. It's denoting that there's authority. No matter where you've been or what you've done, you cannot close the door that Jesus himself has opened. Amen? Sometimes men think that they can close these doors, or sometimes we think that we can open these things, but the power and authority rests with Christ. And so at the onset of this letter, there's this authority being given out to Jesus. The one who writes here, Jesus, has the authority. He can open any door. He can close any door, and we have no say in that, right? And so Jesus praises these people right off the hop. And one of the things he starts by praising, some things that we notice about the church at Philadelphia is that they were faithful. They were faithful. This, this was a faithful church. There was good deeds here. They had what, what, what was called an open door for ministry. Jesus had opened a door for them to go out and take his message to the world, take, go out and take his word to the world, and Jesus praises their deeds. He says, I know what you've done. I see all that you've done. And the New Testament talks a lot about good deeds. Some of us, we, we wonder, well, what's that talking about? Well, in Colossians, for example, in chapter 3, in verse 17, we read, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God our Father. See, it's not just about what we do. It's not just about the things we do, but it's that we do everything with Christ. It's that we do everything with him. It's that we do everything in the name of Christ. I don't know about you, but sometimes I enjoy vacations and trips. Anyone with me? I like going on vacation. I like going on trips. And sometimes when I plan these things out, there's things I look forward to doing. Maybe I plan it around a concert or a festival of some sorts or maybe a golf course, you know. Who knows? Whatever's happening in the area. I'm starting to realize how selfish I am about planning vacations here. But anyways, um, whenever I plan these things, I always plan them about something that's coming up. And, um, and it's good to do that. But usually what I end up finding out at the end of it all is sometimes, you know, there's stuff you're going to do. Sometimes there's stuff that you're looking forward to do. But most of the time, what's most important to you is not what you're going to do when you go on a vacation or a trip, but rather who you're going on that trip with. Rather, who you're going to spend time with. And, and in a lot of ways, isn't that what life's all about? Isn't life all about who we're with? Who we spend time with? Who, who, who we're hanging out with? And this was the faithful church we're talking about here. And, and, and they knew, they knew that they were with Christ. And their deeds were commended. They were walking down that path that Jesus had set out for them. In Ephesians 2.10, we read it a couple weeks ago. It says, for, for your God's workmanship, God has created good works for you to do in advance. And so it's not so much about, the, about there being a shortage of stuff for Christians to do, but really what it's about is it's about being obedient with what God has actually shown you to do. What he's already planned for you to do. So what are good deeds? Well, one definition that quickly popped in my mind as I was thinking about this this past week is when Jesus was talking about the sheep and the goats. And he talked about, you know, often what you do for others, you actually do unto me, right? And, 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 and some people are going to wonder, Lord, when did I ever do this for you? When did I ever do this? When did I ever visit a sick person and, and, and meet you? And Jesus said to them, well, whatever you do unto the least of these, you're actually doing unto me. 
And so in a lot of ways, good deeds are whatever you do. Whatever you do unto God, and, and even, even as important, whatever you do unto the people he loves, that's people around you, right? Good deeds are anything you do to advance the kingdom. It can be as simple as giving a glass of water to someone in need. It could be something like sharing the gospel. It could be sharing the word. It could be encouraging somebody. But there are good deeds for each and every one of us to do. Our faith is seen in our actions. Amen? In the book of James, we read what what became controversial scripture. Um, Some of the church fathers actually wanted to disinclude the book of James because some of this stuff seemed to contradict some of the stuff in Paul's letters. But here we read, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If any one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me, my faith, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there's one God good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. It's a tough scripture. It's a tough one because we have to recognize when we read something like this, the reason why this caused so much controversy is because people were acting as though good deeds justified you. How many of you know good deeds never justify you, right? It's not your deeds that justify you. Deeds aren't what make us right before God. That's your faith. That's your faith in Christ. That's because of what he did for you, right? Deeds are something that we do because we are right with God and because we have tasted and seen that God is good. Deeds don't give us, good deeds don't give us our salvation, but they're a reflection of what God has done inside of each and every one of us. And so when we think about good deeds, when we think about things that we do, we don't do them because we have to earn God's love. We do them because we have God's love. Are you seeing where we're going here? And Jesus commends this church and says, I I see your deeds. I see what you guys are doing. And they're commended for being faithful. They're kind of, most commentators call them the faithful church. Number two, here's another thing. Here's another um, thing we notice about the church at Philadelphia. Is that they were weak. They were weak. Anyone in here ever felt a little weak before? Sometimes that's the worst feeling in the world, right? You have to do something or there's things that you want to accomplish and you just feel weak. You just don't feel like you have the strength to go on. You see, Jesus acknowledges that this church has experienced some difficult times. And yet he commends them for obeying even despite that. You see, and weakness isn't something that our world celebrates or even really prefers to admit to, is it? Often I think we try to hide our weaknesses from other people because we feel a sense of shame. We feel a sense of powerlessness in them. We like to take care of our own business. We like to, you know, want others to think that we have it together. And so admitting that you're weak isn't something that I think is on the popularity list for most people. And oftentimes what happens in, in, in not trying to let people know our weaknesses is we often wear different kinds of masks, right? To avoid letting others know that we're really weak. And so outwardly, we put on this, this picture for people. Outwardly, we try to show people that we have it together. Outwardly, we, we, we want people to believe that, you know, life's good for us. It's easy. Everything's happening right. Yet inwardly, we know that we're weak. And we know that we have limitations. And often this hurts us. When we wear masks, it hurts us, friends, because outwardly we tire ourselves out trying to convince people that we're fine, when inwardly we cannot run from the weakness that we know is there. Our world doesn't celebrate weakness, and yet Scripture has a very different view about weakness. It doesn't see weakness as something bad or to be embarrassed by, but it sees weakness as something that just happens to us because we're human and we have limitations. Rather than closing doors, weakness can actually open doors to allow God to work in and through our lives. Amen? And that's the difference, is because Jesus can redeem anything. Let's read a couple scriptures here that talk about weakness. In 2 Corinthians 12.10, Paul says, That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's in weakness where we know that we need God. It's in weakness when we need to depend on him. There's a famous verse in Isaiah. I think many of you have heard it. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. 
Even youth, youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Our world has one view of weakness. It's often something we try to hide. It's often something that we try to stay away from. And yet, Scripture says that when you're weak, you're actually in an okay position to receive a blessing or to receive help from God. When some people think weakness closes doors, Scripture actually says maybe it, in fact, opens a door for you. In Romans 8, 26, we read this. We read that in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. You ever been at a weak point in your life where you didn't even know how to pray? You didn't even know what to say to God. Things had just kind of gotten bad. They just, just don't have any words. Oh, there's comfort in this scripture, friends. The Spirit's helping you even in your weakness. Even when we don't know how to pray, even when we don't know what to pray for, the Spirit still intercedes for us with words and groans that maybe we can't express, but are expressed. And so when I read through this book and I, I, I thought about this church, they were, commended, they were commended for their deeds, and they were commended even though they were weak because they continued and they stood strong in the mission that God called them to. Number three, another thing we know is about this church in Philadelphia is that they obeyed God's word. They actually obeyed his word. The word of God was important to this church. In, in, in 2 Timothy 3.16, we read about how the word of God is God, all scriptures God breathed. It's useful for tr teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped, right? And this church kept his word. They have obeyed his word even despite persecution, even despite problems that were coming upon them. The word of God was important to them. Is the word of God important to us? I want you to ask yourself that question tonight. And that's not coming across in a condescending way by any means, but is the word of God important to you? Do you treasure it? Do you value it? I was at a conference this past week, and we were talking about the word of God at the Saskatchewan District Conference for the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. And we talked about how Jesus said, you know, you could build your life on two things, right? On the rock or on sand, Right? And he talks about how the storms come, how different things happen in life that we have no control over. But he talks about how if you build your life on sand, when those storms come, when the rains come, when, 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 when troubles come, it's easy for that foundation to fall apart. But if you build your house on rock and those storms come, because you've built on good foundation, all of a sudden you can withstand a lot more of those things. And then he says, the one who built their house on sand is like one who heard the word of God but didn't put it into practice. And he says the one who built their house on rock is the person who heard the word of God but they did put it into practice. And there's a clear distinction there because it's not just about hearing the word of God. How many of you know we could just memorize this stuff all day, right? Right? We could read about it, we could study it, we could know it, we could take notes. But if we're not putting it into practice in our daily life, Jesus says that we're kind of missing the mark of what it's supposed to do in our lives. It's not just about hearing the word. It's not just about memorizing the word. It's not just about passing a test and getting the word. It's about actually putting that, that was put in you, that word that you've received from God, and putting it into practice. There was a woman um, from the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada National Office who was uh, reading out a bunch of stats and um, often when I hear stats, my first question is, is where did you get these from? And, you know, maybe I'm a bit of a cynic like that. But this was a stat, it was a study called the Canadian Bible Engagement Study. It was something done by the EFC, which is the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, and the Canadian Bible Forum. And there were a couple stats that just stood out to me. I'll read them with you now. Um, she said that 14%, 14%, about one in seven Canadian Christians actually read their Bible at least once a week. Only 14% of Christians in Canada, from this study, the study that they did throughout Canada, actually read their Bible once a week. One in seven Canadians, which is 13%, and about one in four Christians, which is 23%, strongly agree that the Bible is actually relevant to modern life. Only about one in 10 Canadians, 11%, 
And about two in 10 Christians, 21%, reflect on the meaning of the Bible for their lives at least a few times a week. Only 6% of Canadians and only 11% of Christians talk to others about the Bible outside of the religious service that they attend, that they attend once a week. And I read through, and I, and I, I sat there and I, I listened to her talk about these stats and I recognized that there's an issue. There's a problem. If these things are correct, then do we truly value the word of God the way we should? Do we treasure it? 14%, one in seven Christians read it once a week. You see, one of the things about this church that impressed me the most was Jesus said that you have obeyed my word despite what you've been going through. And they were probably very busy people. But you've obeyed my word. You've kept it. You've hidden it in your heart, right? This is something that's important to you. It's impossible to live the, Christ, the life that Christ wants for us, the life that he desires for us, if we aren't people who know and love and obey his word. It's tough to be that kind of Christian. It's tough to be that kind of person. And so this is a church who obeyed the word of God. It was something that they put into practice. Number four, finally, they persevered. And maybe this speaks one of the greatest things about them, right? They persevered. In Romans 12, it tells us to be patient in affliction. Be patient in affliction, right? Be joyful. Be patient in affliction. Fervent in prayer. This church faced opposition. They, they faced a lot of their opposition from unbelieving and hostile Jews. Remember that part in the verse where they talked about the synagogue of Satan and you probably checked out not really understanding what was happening there? What, what, they were, what, what, what Jesus was actually saying was that some of the Jewish leaders in, the, in, in, in that century, they actually felt they had authority to control the synagogue and to control God's people. In other words, they decided who's in and who's out. They decided who was real and who wasn't real. And yet such a notion is absolutely false, right? And Jesus lectured the Pharisees about this time and time again, how they, they, sh they, they try to shut the door on people and they themselves don't even enter the kingdom. And Jesus has authority to let into his kingdom, let into his family, whoever he wants. And he chooses all of us, friends. For there's no difference between Jews or Gentiles, but he's opened the door to every one of us. And this church faced opposition from Jewish leaders. They faced opposition even from city leaders within Philadelphia who were wanting to spread Greek culture, and they kind of got in the way of this. The Christians got in the way of this, and they faced all sorts of opposition, yet they didn't shrink back, but they kept moving forward in the work of God. They persevered. Perseverance isn't easy. <laughs> Sometimes the easy way out is to quit, right? You ever felt like your efforts were going nowhere? Ever felt discouraged? Ever felt like you wanted to quit? I know I've been there. When opposition comes again to you, you have really, really have two choices. You either shrink back or you keep trying. You either throw in the towel or you keep going. You call it quits or you even, you know, get a little bit more fervent in what you want to do. And this is a church that rather than shrinking back, rather than quitting, rather than calling it quits, rather than taking the easy way out, they moved forward. And they persevered. They followed in what God wanted them to do. And scripture calls us to be people who persevere in the power that only Jesus himself can give us. And that's the thing. It's not like they were doing this in their own power. They were doing this in the power of Christ. And so this is the church of Philadelphia. They were doing good. They were a faithful church. We see some great things here. They were faithful. They were weak, and yet God made them strong. They, they obeyed God's word. They persevered no matter what came their way. And so, you know, when you, th when, when you read the first part of this letter, you could think to yourself, well, that's great. Let's just wrap this up here, right? You know, I'm in a peace at this point, right? You know, this church is doing good. I have no more instructions for you. Yet Jesus still has words of comfort for them. Jesus still has words of instruction for them. And I'll focus on two points, and then we'll pray. Here's, this, here's some of the stuff Jesus instructed them to do. Number one, he told them that great reward and great treasure awaited them if they continued to walk forward. Great reward and great treasure awaited them. Jesus talked about this in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. He talked about where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. He said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin don't destroy and where thieves do not break in or steal. 
Anybody who trains for something usually does it with an end goal in mind. Would you agree? Think about it. Whether it's an Olympic athlete, whether it's an athlete, whether it's a student, whether it's somebody who's just working at a job, often we train because we know that after all the hard work, after you know, all the hours, after all the persevering, after all the endurance, that there's something greater waiting for us on the other side. And that's usually meeting our goal. That's usually accepting what we've worked so hard for. It's usually getting to where we've always wanted to be. And that's kind of what, that's, that's actually exactly what Jesus is communicating to this church. He's saying to them, in a sense, don't just live for today, but greater things are yet to come. And so he talks about this idea of pillars, that they are going to be pillars in the temple of God. And I don't know about you, but when I read that, I thought, my goodness, what is he talking about here, Right? I, I, I couldn't quite understand that. You'll have to go back in Revelation 3 and read it a little bit more. But he talks about pillars. And I'll give you a little background about this city. It was central Turkey the, in the first century, as much as any other time. It was, it was a notorious place for earthquakes. And Philadelphia had suffered one of the worst earthquakes in history 50 or more years before this letter was written. Okay? And so earthquakes was something that they were familiar with. That wasn't something that would have caught them by surprise. People knew what that was. And much of their city was destroyed and had to be rebuilt. And in those days, the fine public buildings were, you know, were, were, were particularly dangerous in a time of crisis. Because imagine you know, how nice those things once looked, right? The ancient architecture, the civic structures, you know, the temples, how those things would be affected in earthquakes. You know, watching them shake, watching them fall, watching them buckle and come down to the destruction. It wasn't a very pretty sight. And so these people were familiar with earthquakes. It was something that they knew had happened. They had known, had affected their city, had torn things down. Now imagine the effect of Jesus' words to them. When I read about this, it didn't have a crazy effect on my life because I wasn't looking at it from their perspective. But when you actually look at it from their perspective, imagine the effect of Jesus' words to a city like Philadelphia that knew plenty about earthquakes and what collapsed temples looked like. The promise of promising the church that those who conquered, those who continued, those who continued to press on would be made pillars in the temple of God. It meant a lot to them. We're not talking about stone. We're not talking about marble here. But what Jesus is talking about is he's giving us an image of a temple that's made of living human beings with Jesus himself as the foundation. And so in other words, the church is the new temple. Ordinary Christians in Philadelphia, far away from Jerusalem, they have the opportunity to be pillars in the temple of God. It was a promise for them. It was something to look forward to. It was, it, 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 it was a crown. It was an achievement that they were working towards. In a city known for earthquakes, this was a promise to cherish. That's why Jesus talked this way to them. He wasn't just saying this in some sort of metaphorical language. This is something that they would have been very familiar with because of their past in their city. And Jesus promises them greater things if they continue to walk with him. And how many of you know Jesus has promised us greater things than what we currently see in front of us right now? Jesus has promised us far greater things. But in order to get there, we can't just quit. We can't just stop. But we have to continue moving forward with him. Amen? We have to continue walking with him. Because greater things are yet to come. Greater things are yet to happen for the church. Finally, he encourages them to press on. I took that word, but that's essentially what he's saying. He's telling them to continue, to keep walking. There's an end in sight. There's a goal in sight. Jesus will look after his church, and we can trust him to do that. But continue in what you're doing. Continue to love others. Continue to share the message of Christ. Continue to, continue to do good deeds because Christ is with you. In Galatians 6, 9, we read this. This is a good, this is a good verse to, to memorize. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Amen? Do not become weary. It's easy to become weary. It's easy to quit. It's easy to see things stacked against you and not want to continue. But we must heed the message of this church, or that was written to this church, sorry. That even though things appear to be going great, we must still continue to walk in Christ. We must still continue to walk with him, running the race, if you will. Because there's much work to do. There's greater things ahead. In the words of Paul, we need to press on. We need to continue. We need to continue to go after the prize, right, in order that we may attain it in Christ Jesus. 
And for some of us tonight, that's just what we need to hear. For some of us, we've had, we've, we've had a time where we felt weak. You've had a rough go. And maybe God would encourage you tonight that you, you need to keep going. But if you try doing it on your own, it's going to be very difficult. But you need to keep going with his help and in his strength. Looking to him. I got a big quote here to read to you. So follow me here. As I was reading through my commentaries on this, I found N.T. Wright to be the most helpful. And here's what he says regarding this whole letter. He sums it up really well here. He says, equipped with this regal power, Jesus has opened a door right in front of the Philadelphia Christians. And he's urging them to go through it. As with Paul's use of the same picture, you can see it in that verse. The meaning is almost certainly that they have an opportunity not just to stand firm, but to, actually, but to make advances, to take the good news of Jesus into places and hearts where it is not yet reached. The qualifications are all in place. They have some power, not very much, but with the backing of Jesus, they have all they need. And they have been faithful, keeping his word and not denying his name. They must take courage and go through the door they must grasp the opportunity while they have, that they have while it's still there. And so here are some questions I leave with us tonight to consider before we pray. Will we be faithful to Christ throughout our lives? Maybe you're weak. Maybe you're, you're having a tough go. Maybe you're recognizing your limitations. Will you go to him and ask him for strength? The one who can give you strength. The spirit who intercedes on your behalf when you're weak. Will we obey his word? Will we take his word seriously? Hopefully we don't become like the 14%, right? Will we make an effort to get into his word daily and allow him to speak to us, allow him to teach us, allow him to show us what it is he'd want us to do in this world? Will we be people who press on? Will we be people who persevere, knowing that what lies ahead is greater than anything that we see in front of us right now? He who has an ear, listen. This is the reputation of this church, friends. This is the kind of life that we must seek to live in ourselves. And so my encouragement to you tonight is if you find yourself in any of these situations, You'd recognize two things. Greater things are ahead for you. We need to press on. But maybe more importantly, maybe, maybe what you need to hear is God's with you. And he wants to help you in this. And you don't walk it alone. But he wants to help. Let me pray for us tonight. Lord, I just thank you for um, the love that you have for each and every one of us in this room tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the just the good things you've given to us, every single blessing, God, we thank you for. And Lord, we just pray, God, I pray for each person in here tonight. Lord, I don't know where everyone is. You do. God, you know them better than they know themselves. And so, Lord, I just pray for each person, Lord, for those who are feeling weak tonight. Lord, would you be their strength? Lord, would you encourage them? Would you help them to continue on in this race? In your power, in the power that you alone can give. Lord, I pray for those, Lord God, who just feel like they're having a tough time enduring. Lord, help them to endure in your strength as well. God, help us to love your word. Help us to love you. Help us to continue to do good deeds, I pray. For some of us, Lord, we, we recognize that maybe we've just fallen short. Lord, help us, God, to continue in on whatever it is you've called us to do. And so I pray for each person tonight, Lord, wherever we're at, whatever situation we have, Lord, that you would just enter into our situation. And Spirit, you would give us the power, the strength, the confidence that we need to continue to walk out this, this life of faith that you've called us to. And so bless each one of us tonight. Help us. Be our strength, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so the Church of Philadelphia, like I said, is really one of those churches. The wording's a bit confusing in there. It's a little bit more difficult to understand, but they're really a model that we could really glean from. If you want to see what, what, what a good way to follow God is, it's to, it's to depend on him, depend on his strength, depend on his power, right? To love him and follow him. And so I, I release everyone tonight with the blessing of that. Just go out there, continue to seek him in his word. 
Maybe you might want to take a couple minutes and just pray. If you want to, there's going to be some music playing, and this, there's always an opportunity here. Maybe you need some encouragement tonight for some prayer. If that's you, I'll be hanging around up here, and if you want someone to pray with, I'd gladly pray with you. Otherwise, I just want to dismiss you tonight. God bless you. Be encouraged, and um, take the encouragement from this church and, and go out and live for God. God bless you.